Good morning, good evening, everyone, wherever you're joining us from uh, today. Welcome to our webinar on the human factor impacts of future fuels. Uh, so we all know that the 2020s must be the decade of action if maritime is to hit the targets set by the IMO, uh, whatever comes out of MAPC 18 next week. So we also know that future fuels have a big part to play in the industry's drive for getting greenhouse gas emissions down and the switch away from traditional fuels. However, the conventions of bunkering and operating traditionally fueled vessels will not be the same for those operating future fuels. We'll need new processes and procedures, new safety measures, new training. So as we make progress with the energy transition, our seafarers, their skills, expertise, and their safety will be more important than ever. So as we look to the future, the human factor impacts of future fields, and to mark the day of the seafarer, I'm delighted that we have such an esteemed panel here to speak with us today. The lineup includes Matt Dunlop, Director of Sustainability and Decarbonisation at V Group, and strategic partner and secondee to the Merce McKinney Muller Centre for Zero Carbon Shipping. John Lloyd, Chief Executive of the Nautical Institute. Stephen Jones, founder of C the Seafarers Happiness Index. And Martha Selwyn, the manager at the United Nations Global Compact. And, and just a reminder to everyone who's joined, you can post questions for our panel using the Slido link in the webinar chat. So without further ado, I'm going to get this conversation going with uh, a question to all of our uh, panel today. Um, and that is, we know that future fuels pose both risks and opportunities across the maritime value chain. What do you see as the key risks and opportunities for seafarers as we transition to future fuels. And John, perhaps I could come to you for your thoughts on that one, please. Yes, Andy, thanks for setting the scene. I think it's a, it's a really important question as to what, what are the opportunities and risks that approach with any sort of transition. But I think the whole gl globe, the whole community around the world is engaged in the conversation about how we can make places uh, better to work, how we can protect the environment uh, properly and consider the next generations that are going to come behind us. So I think everybody wants to be part of a community that's doing the right thing. And Maritime's no different in, in that respect. But the next generation of fuels are going to bring about, as you mentioned, a whole range of new challenges. And I think the risks for our seafarers are that we we rush this through uh, in a way that they're not properly prepared for. So we we need to engage in that conversation now. We we already know quite a lot about what the risks are likely to be. So we need to help them prepare for the hazards that they're going to be facing and the precautions that they need to take in, in the workplace. What are the principles behind safe handling of the next generation of fuels and particularly the impact on, on operations for bunkering? And I think it's not enough for us just to look inside our own shop on our own little world. We want to be satisfied that all those other operators around us on the adjacent ships, the one next to us on the berth, the bunkering operators themselves have also had the right training development um, and, and professional commitment to ensuring a safe operation as well. So I do see that great opportunity for embracing the right message, but also um, a significant amount of preparedness that needs to be done beforehand. Thank you. Uh, thanks, John. Um, Matt, perhaps I could come to you next for your thoughts. Uh, it's a very good question to start us off, uh, Andy. Um, and as John has just mentioned, uh, the move towards low or zero carbon alternative energy sources will bring new safety challenges and the need for shipping to be more uh, aware of the complex hazards. And as John mentioned, you know, the key here is to understand what these challenges are and the design and operational measures that the industry can implement to reduce the risk to tolerable levels. Um, you mentioned what we've been doing together with Lloyd's Register Maritime Decarbonisation Hub and the Merce McKinney Moller Centre for Zero Carbon Shipping, specifically on ammonia uh, as a fuel. And that's just been published today, as you mentioned. Uh, and therefore, there's a real important part of this report, which is focused on human factor, um, looking at the, the, the tolerable levels um, for 
technical and operational safeguards to be implemented, etc. So this is now an industry uh, paper for everyone to understand that safety is our number one priority and we will not rush anything through. Uh, we, we, will, we will halt, stop the job if need to until we get uh, full safety parameters met. But to answer your question briefly, <laughs> what are the risks? Seafarer shortages. We're already short, uh, officer supply shortage uh, has hit an all time high. COVID has impacted it. Uh, the Russia-Ukraine war, etc., and all of this has a has significant impact on crew training. So we need to be aware of where we are today before we start planning for the future. And of course, skill shortages um, associated with our seafarers. Um, Eighty percent of decarbonisation between now and 2030 will come from energy efficiency solutions, and that's technology. And therefore, there's more training for our seafarers to be to be implemented, and, and, and we're asking more of our seafarers to to join us on this journey. Um, and that's before we come for the upskilling for the alternative fuels, including the training and competence, etc., for all vessel types. We've been carrying uh, hazardous cargoes on our chemical tankers safely for many years now, but with associated dangerous cargo endorsements and energy major matrix requirements and associated remuneration uplift. And again, the challenge here is to bring the dry cargo colleagues, crew members and seafarers, men and women, bulk carriers and container ships and other dry cargo up to that standard. And let's not underestimate the challenge there. And lastly, the opportunities. You know, we need to focus as an industry on retention and that is the key to our success going forward. Huge improvement to make in diversity, equity, and inclusion. And again, this is a, a requirement for us to be successful going forward. And the last opportunity here is seafarers with green credentials and the desire to be part of the decarbonization journey will have a career for life in the biggest transformation that industry has seen. So uh, again, uh, Really good discussion, huge opportunities, but let's not underestimate the challenges. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Matt. Uh, certainly covering a lot of ground in our responses. Uh, Martha, perhaps I could I could come to you next, please. Yes, definitely. Um, yeah, really interesting uh, comments there by Matt, touching on a lot of the things that, that I also wanted to, to bring into the conversation. Um, so firstly, maybe just a little bit about some of the work that, that I've been leading over the past year and a half. Um, so on behalf of the UN Global Compact, I've been coordinating uh, the work of our Maritime Just Transition Task Force, which is a task force that was launched back at COP26 uh, with the IMO, ILO, um, ITF and ICS. Um, so lots of abbreviations there, but it's a maritime community. <laughs> so hopefully you can keep up. Um, and we were basically formed to address precisely these questions, you know, what is going to be the impact on alternative fuels on the workforce um, and on our seafarers and particularly the, the key aim of a just transition, a fair transition, is to already consider what the risks are going to, going to be from the outset, as well as how we can maximise any kind of social opportunities. Um, so one of the first things we did as a task force was to try to get a an understanding as to how many seafarers would sort of require additional training on some of these alternative fuels. And um, so we commissioned MDNB to undertake a report for us looking at um, three different decarbonisation scenarios, uh, one looking at the sort of current IMO uh, decarbonisation scenarios, so reducing uh, 50 percent of uh, CO2 emissions at least by 2050. Um, and then we also looked at the Paris Agreement scenario, so 100 percent reduction by 2050. Um, and here we see that in that Paris Agreement scenario that around 800,000 seafarers could require some kind of additional training on the three most prominent alternative fuels um, by the mid 2030s. So that's quite a stark, <laughs> a stark number requiring some kind of additional training by that point. Of course, these are just scenarios, but we know and as has already been alluded to um, critical negotiations happening this week and next week on the revision of the greenhouse gas strategy, whereby um, we hope that a 0% target 
uh, of CO2 emissions by 2050 will be the outcome. So that 800,000 figure by the mid 2030s could indeed uh, be, be, in a, be a reality. Um, but as you know, Matt alluded to, um, you know, the, there are many things that also need to happen <laughs> before we get to that point as well. Um, so one of the other things that we've also been looking at as the task force um, in the report that I mentioned was, well, what kind of new skills might these fuels, you know, require? Um, and what kind of um, CFA are we even looking at, um, you know, in the next 10, uh, 20 years? Um, and here sort of some of the, the key headlines are, and, you know, as, as Matt kind of also already alluded to is, um, you know, we're looking at, of course, increased digital skills. Of course, safety competences will be increasingly essential when we look at the three most prevalent fuels. Um, but also a sort of an increased STEM background, so science, technology, education and maths, and then these kind of core engineering skills. And I think it's also worth pointing out that it's not just shipping that's going to require these skills. I mean, these are your classic core green skills that industries like offshore wind, the hydrogen economy, you know, these are skills that are going to be in demand through other industries. So once again, really highlighting the importance of, of shipping, uh, look at, looking outwards um, in that respect. Um, but of course, all these, um, you know, green skills with respect to new fuels, you know, they're not happening in a vacuum. Digitization, I just mentioned, Matt mentioned, but of course, automation, really critical trend um, that will have a, that will have a, an impact on shipping. Um, I know World Maritime University have actually just released a very interesting roadmap looking at this, which I believe shows that in shipping specifically, there may be some impact on some of um, what we might, what might call a low skilled uh, profession or low skilled aspect of maritime, but those jobs won't go. Um, they'll just be replaced um, with sort of um, competences around remote control centers and these kind of aspects. So once again, not necessarily seeing a change in the number of jobs, but the job profiles will change. So we are looking at a very, you know, increasingly um, very highly trained um, profession, potentially moving um, um, more, more remotely in, in some instances. So, of course, you know, there'll be a, a, a need to upskill and provide that new training. And I think here, of course, you know, there are risks in the sense that, you know, will um, existing pools of seafarers be able to be upskilled so that they can participate in this in this industry, which, of course, will be essential to ensuring a just transition. And um, also, of course, bearing in mind what Matt just mentioned with respect to what are the sort of geopolitical or other kind of, you know, trends that we're seeing that are also sort of impacting seafarers and where seafarers are being uh, recruited from. Um, but, you know, I think there are also quite a few opportunities here. And I think, you know, as Matt also alluded to in that respect, you know, this is going to be and of course already is in so many respects. But if we now add the competences that are going to be required for you know, new kinds of fuels. I mean, these are going to be hugely synergistic with a number of other industries. So you really are talking about having, a, you know, a career that could span into different sectors, you know, really bang in the center of the energy transition. So I think, you know, in some ways that could be a risk to recruiting, but it's also an opportunity because that talent pool can, um, you know, certainly increase. Um, and of course, also, if we're looking at new kinds of um, profiles with respect to STEM or other kinds of these core competences that will be needed for the new fuels, you know, that opens up 50% of the population <laughs> um, and actually using that opportunity to get, you know, really highly qualified, highly trained women. There's already a lot happening with respect to women in STEM. That's a movement that, you know, offshore wind and other industries are capitalizing on. So that's a huge opportunity um, to really tap into that, that, that talent pool that, that we know Maritime hasn't been uh, so good at yet. And one final thing that, that I'll add on that is I think you know, this is a huge opportunity as we think about, you know, attracting um, new kinds of professionals, retaining the professionals that we have, of also really thinking about, well, what 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 is that kind of connection with decent work and job quality? Because if you are going to be competing with other sectors, then this is also a time to look at, well, what 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 kind of a what what is that what is that decent work element? How can we make sure that 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 job quality, wages, all these really critical aspects. Um, you know, are also um, taken into consideration. And that really is the kind of the heart of, of a just transition. So really combining, you know, new skills, new kinds of training for the green transition, but also critically with that um, decent work element as well. Yeah, thanks, Martha. Um, and that brings me nicely, actually, to, to mm -hmm. you, Stephen. Uh, what do you think? Yeah, thanks. Hi, everyone. Great to be here. Um, Martha touched upon a study that I'd seen, and it, I think it stresses a really important point, saying something like 800,000 seafarers need training. Um, 
I'm not sure that I agree with the study insofar as it kind of suggests that there's a million that don't, that are already perhaps ready for it. And I don't think that is necessarily the case. So it's all kind of 1.8, 1.9 million, whatever we agree the figure of seafarers are going to have to have some role in this. Um, one of the things that I'm most proud about the Seafarers Happiness Index and working with the Mission to Seafarers is that we perhaps are able to dig a little bit deeper below the kind of surface level in the industry. I think, you know, the blue chip companies have always been perhaps more ready to go green. And it's below those levels that really where so many of our ships and seafarers are perhaps likely to be struggling a little bit more. Uh, I mean, for me, there's always been that old adage that you train for the known and you educate for the unknown. And at the moment, it feels that there's so much unknown surrounding all of this, which for seafaring being such a process driven checklist kind of operating environment, I think that's really, really problematic, more so than perhaps anything else we've had to deal with. So we have a, a, a kind of situation where so much is at the moment rumor, guesswork, and you know we're, we're not really in that position to, to, to have seafarers following, and that's what's always happened. You know, we've created an environment where seafarers follow the rules, they're set out, the checklist, etc. And we're just not ready to do that. And of course, you know, handling or using future fuels comes with huge challenges attached. And um, it, it's not clear to me that we're really fully embracing seafarers as part of that, partly because, as has been touched upon before, that there's no definite, agreed, kind of clear pathway to decarbonisation yet. And lest we forget that the, uh, the road to hell is paved with good intentions and it's not really clear what route we're, we're going to be following. Um, the risk, as I hear it from seafarers reporting back to the Seafarers Happiness Index, is that they feel... Um, ignored, sidelined. There's a debate going on that you know, massively involves them, but they don't feel pulled into it. They don't feel like they have a voice. I've heard from chief engineers who say they're constantly hearing these debates going on, but they do not have a say and they're not being engaged with through their companies or whatever mechanism would be necessary to do that. So I think we're in a position where we really need to have a cascade effect of training. And I think it's great to be in the company of, of IMRS, of the Nautical Institute, um, you know, leading professional bodies whose members really have to be at the forefront of this cascade of knowledge. So we need to make sure that all of those members have the skills, the tools, the knowledge, the information they need to be able to be empowered to go out and really help the rest of the seafaring workforce while there's still perhaps that disconnect between the rest of the industry so that's me yeah th thanks Stephen uh, Martha perhaps I could just come back to you briefly for your uh, response to Stephen's comments and uh, what your thoughts are yeah no no definitely and and thanks thanks Steve. maybe just to to clarify specifically that that 800,000 number because I totally agree um, so um, when we say when we use that term 800,000 this is in reference to and um, the fact that the, the decarbonization scenario that we looked at was set, it's was obviously suggesting that by the mid 2030s, not all vessels will be um, will, will have alternative fuels. <laughs> we wish that they would, of course, uh, for the climate. Um, but that, that certainly is very, very unlikely, if not impossible. So the 800,000 are just referring to the number of seafarers that would potentially be on vessels carrying fuels, um, carrying or um, using alternative fuels. But of course, by 2050, let's say all vessels are using alternative fuels, then of course, every single seafarer will have to require some kind of additional uh, training to make sure that this is safe. Um, so yes, just to clarify that certainly um, most all seafarers will, will, will have to um, require that kind of additional training. And it's just those 800,000, potentially, I said, it's just a scenario um, because those are the number of vessels that, that, that would potentially be using the alternative fuels. Uh, but maybe just to come back also on another point that, that you mentioned at the end about the importance of, of seafarers having a say and I think that is you know that is the most fundamental component to the just transition <laughs> um, so the social dialogue so that discussion between workers employers governments and um, that ability to be able to, to provide inputs and take part in, in you know uh, in workshops in other kind of dialogues um, to ensure that this is not this is a, a fair process whereby everyone is able to contribute um, is essential. And, and we see in other sectors 
um, instances where that that's working well and where that isn't working so well. So yes, critical um, that that stakeholders and bodies are able to continue, um, you know, speaking and making sure that that CFAIR is able to contribute um, to the discussion. Thanks, Martha. Um, yeah, we've had a, had an interesting question here on the uh, on Slido. Uh, which I think, Matt, if you're okay, I'd like to I'd like to pose it to you at least initially. Uh, and the question is: Do we think maritime employers have the appetite to undertake the training required? It's a very good question, uh, and these are the sort of questions that we want to encourage others to 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 bring to the table uh, and use this opportunity as a real engagement uh, opportunity. Um, <clears throat> I was at sea for 16 years cannot compare to what life is like today on board ships. Um, the technology, the standards, safety records are better, of course, and, and, and accidents and injury uh, frequencies reduced because of the improved standards. But to answer the question, do the maritime employers have the appetite? At B Group here, we've got a pool of about 45,000 seafarers. And keeping it simple, we do not have an option but to undertake the training requirements. We need to be at the forefront of this journey that we're on together. Some are fast followers, um, some are first movers, but we, there's a few stragglers in our industry that we really need to bring up to the, the, the plate and, and be aligned as an industry, collaborate as partners, and, and learn together. So this is, you cannot opt out of this. If you opt out, don't be in shipping, you're in the wrong place. So therefore we need, we need to start yesterday, not today, to make sure that we are ready for tomorrow. I hope that answers the question, Andy. Yeah, thank, thank you very much, Matt. Um, there, there is sort of a follow-on question to, to the statements that, that people have uh, and comments people have made already uh, from Steph, Steph McClay. Uh, morning, uh, Steph. Um, and perhaps I can I can pose this one to you, John, for your, your thoughts. Um, so the need for training is, is kind of accepted and emphasized by everybody on the panel and, and in the industry. So, so my question it, or the question that's been posed is how what's the best way to design and deliver that training? I, I think it's a great question. And I think, you know, part of the, the core construct of just transition is about everybody having access to the training they need um, on a global scale. And I think if we're to have an agile workforce, then that um, training and assessment needs to be of a harmonized standard. So we need there is a, an imperative for collaboration in, in this regard, um, but also for commitment. Now, there are expert trainers all over the world, um, but nobody's got one single source uh, solution that will, will solve everybody's problems at one go. So I think we need to work collaboratively by engaging those stakeholders. Seafarers, we've already heard that, bring them into the conversation. We've got employers who will have uh, cost and consistency concerns, um, and, and the whole industry will be looking nervously about the, the reliability of that training and the agility of the workforce going forward. So we need to bring it um, to the table and work out a harmonised standard in the same same way underpinning principles that uh, STCW does. Um, and, and then we need to have some ways of checking that it's put in place. I think there's a couple of things we need to be careful of. I think we need to recognise um, that if we think we're going to prop people on board the ship and then train them, we're kind of getting the uh, the cart before the horse there. But, you know, it's the wrong way around. We need to make sure they're safe before they go on board. And we also need to recognise that actually seafarers are pretty busy a lot of the time. Uh, there is not a lot of spare time for them to be doing really important training and assessment for uh, a brand new set of challenges. So I, I, I kind of see um, the likelihood uh, that a significant portion of this is going to be based onshore. Um, I think we need some practical components as well as some theory components to it. And by bringing those training communities together from different nationalities, from training institutions, and sharing best practice and the ideas, we need to get value for money in the solution. You know, we, we need a good quality solution uh, that is affordable. 
Um, because just going back to Matt's point, yes, everybody attending this webinar will be taking this, the training obligation seriously, but it is about the sorts of people who don't come to these uh, events and not listening to um, the, the forward-looking conversations, who are looking for um, mediocrity because they believe that's the only business model. We need to demonstrate that's not an acceptable business model, and that involves a hugely wide community. Um, you know, we've got P and I, we've got insurers. Everybody's got a responsibility to raise the game here, um, and port state control, and so on and so forth. So, cutting back to the chase of the question, it is about the training um, providers. It is about the flag states adopting and agreeing in a harmonious standard. But I think there's a huge opportunity here for industry leadership uh, to set that standard. Thanks. Thanks very much, John. Um, Steve, if, if I could come to you with a question, please, to sort of bring the focus back to the seafarer. Um, we saw a change in the latest seafarer happiness index from quarter one 2023, which saw uh, the how happy about the training you receive score drop from 8.12 to 7.41. What do you what do you think that says about the future and especially how about how we ensure that seafarers are ready for future fields operations. Yeah, thanks. Um, just for those watching who don't know, the Seafarers Happiness Index, working alongside the Mission of Seafarers, is a, a quarterly survey that goes out to the global fleet. So we get seafarers from all kinds of vessels, all kinds of backgrounds, a very, very wide demographic. And as I said earlier, perhaps from places where we ordinarily don't hear from seafarers. Uh, so we asked them st 10 standard questions about the basic kind of building blocks of how they feel about everything from connectivity through food, health and well-being, um, interactions on board, workload, wages, and training is one of those issues that we cover. And so, yes, um, it did fall last time around. It's, it's, um, it's, it's one of those questions that tends to have a lot of peaks and troughs in training, there doesn't seem to be one kind of unified message about things. Um, as is human nature, when the numbers tend to fall and sentiment is is on the on the kind of drop, then we tend to get more written responses from seafarers explaining why they feel disgruntled or unhappy, etc. And the kind of quotes we were getting recently were focusing on, I'm just looking at some of the quotes here, ineffective training programs, unfriendly learning management systems, um, training overload, um, the kind of the workload balance on board really with the focus on training as well. And, and you know, as John very rightly pointed out, seafarers are incredibly, um, you know, kind of busy when at sea and to have these kind of renewed focus on different types of training thrown at them in the mix as well as kind of keeping every other plate spinning as well does seem to me to be very problematic and I think we're going to have to really rethink that kind of the balance between what we're expecting of seafarers in the here and now and what the, the demands are and you know listening to, to really great phrases like just transition etc well that you know that does imply that we're going to have a just future but what about the present are we treating seafarers in the way that they need to be treated now to get us to the point where we are worthy of their time energy and efforts one of the the kind of key areas that people that seafarers have been responding about is the fact that they didn't feel terribly well looked after through COVID. There were all these problems. We know about shore leave and crew changes and all the rest of it. And now there's a sense that, oh, oh, you're back, are you, with more things for us to do and you want to focus on us again now, do you? Well, that didn't work out terribly well when we needed that focus on us. So I think as a public relations exercise to engage with seafarers as the stakeholders that we're so reliant upon, there really does have to be a real change in the message and the way we want to engage and do things to show the positives, to show the, you know, the, to reflect what we demand of seafarers and really do things in a joined up partnership in a, in a symmetrical sense. Thanks, Stephen. Thank you. Um, Martha, if, if I could come to you with a question, um, kind of building on, on Steve's, Steve's uh, thoughts there. Um, 
we hear a lot about the need for a fair and just transition to a zero carbon future, um, especially when it comes to the seafarers. Through your work on the Maritime Just Transition Task Force, can you share with us how we ensure that the energy transition is a just and fair one for seafarers? Thanks. Uh, that's a very big question. <laughs> Um, but I think actually a lot of um, a lot of it has sort of already been said to an extent or elements of it. So just coming back to to John um, and Steve's point, of course, um, you know, recognizing that seafarers are very busy, recognizing that we don't want to overburden them further. And um, so the way that that training is delivered um, and designed, um, the costs um, that all has to be done in a way that is fair and doesn't place sort of additional strain. And of course, I think we all recognize how difficult it can be to retain information uh, when we're overloaded with it, you know, constantly. So of course that, that, that same needs to apply. So ensuring that the costs um, are, you know, are predominantly borne by industry um, rather than the seafarer and ensuring that it's not delivered in a way that is overburdensome, recognizing how busy seafarers already are will be really essential. So that would be a key element of, of, of ensuring that just transition for them. Um, and then, of course, the SCCW has already been referenced. And, you know, here, when I look at other sectors who I kind of work with on just transition, you know, one does have to recognize how unique shipping is, that it does have a global training standard, you know, ensuring a just transition for workers in different nationalities, where there are sort of national standards, which, you know, where there isn't that kind of global, even if it is just a minimum standard, is much harder. But having ensuring a global just transition for seafarers with a you know you know fit for purpose STCW and makes everything you know more more likely. So of course you know fantastic that the STCW is sort of being reviewed um, over the next few years, um, and of course you know these kind of green skills or skills for alternative fuels will be one of the key components um, that that review will take into consideration. Of course, um, speed um, will be critical. Um, and, you know, what we whatever we can do in that interim. So between now and when that convention comes reviewed will be you know, really important. Uh, one of the things that, that we'll be doing um, as a task force um, in sort of close uh, collaboration and partnership with the IMO is to begin identifying those kind of cross cutting competences between the alternative fuels so that we can hopefully already begin to fast track some kind of guidelines. Um, but of course, you know, the STCW and that kind of global training standard is critical for a just transition. Um, it's already been mentioned, but investing in training, I mean, once again, not unique to shipping, but, you know, the kind of investment roadmaps that are undertaken by governments and industry with respect to technologies are enormous. And the training and investment in skills just often doesn't feature as much. And once again, I'm not saying that is specific to maritime. That's something that, that we see in general. So much more alignment between net zero strategies and training and skills and seeing investment and training, training centers and technologies to support training, um, you know, is just as important. So making sure that that's on an equal footing. Um, and then, of course, one other critical element um, for that, for the just transition is also recognizing uh, where different countries are at with respect to seafarer training. Um, just to name an example of a country that, that I've been working more with over the last year is the Philippines, which may come as no surprise. Um, and of course, the Philippines has had, um, you know, some challenges, um, you know, um, over the over the past sort of few months and years with respect to keeping up with what is currently um, required under the STCW. And of course, they just had some good news a few months ago, whereby EMSA sort of um, green lighted and said that you know those 50,000 seafarers that potentially might have lost their jobs won't lose their jobs but of course the Philippines needs to now sort of react and make sure and that is able to comply with what is currently required so once again it's that what do we need to do to support what is currently the case versus then that kind of gap that might then be there in the future so making sure that we're supporting um, some of these countries and I think here once again going back to the discussions at the IMO if it is indeed agreed, which we hope it will be, that there could be some kind of economic measure um, to support then where revenue could be generated, then that revenue should also go to seafarer training. <laughs> um, so any kind of revenue from a carbon tax um, that, that could potentially be agreed on over the next sort of two weeks, you know, making sure that that revenue is available for training and making sure that some of these countries like the Philippines are also then able to use some of that money to support um, with, with training um, in, the, in that respective country and countries. 
So these are just some of the things. And of course, the really important aspect of social dialogue, making sure that seafarers can actually contribute. You know, a lot of their knowledge is so valuable <laughs> as well. Um, you know, this is the kind they actually know what's happening <laughs> on board. So actually, when we talk about energy efficiency, all these things, like this isn't just a nice to have, it's essential. And it makes sense from all kinds of perspectives. Um, so, you know, I think we also need to, you know, see them as a total asset <laughs> with respect to all these things. And it's not just a box ticking exercise to do a survey like these. This is the knowledge that we need to actually make sure that this transition is effective. So I think that's also an important thing, seeing as partners versus just, um, you know, employees. So once again, these are just a couple of things. It's a big question. Um, but one thing that I will also say is that, you know, and obviously Steve mentioned COVID, you know, since COVID, that kind of and I'm quite new to maritime, so maybe this is my naivety, um, but that kind of collaboration and constructive dialogue that exists between um, different stakeholders in the maritime industry, particularly since COVID. I mean, you have, you know, the ITF, IMEC, ICS, you know, lots of stakeholders all trying to engage together, all trying to tackle these questions collectively. And, you know, that is really important. And we don't see that in other industries. Aviation doesn't have a just transition task force. <laughs> and that's because there isn't that kind of um, as much collaboration or trust that's been built between those stakeholders. So we do have a lot of those uh, platforms and dialogue in place. Um, and now, as I said, it's a matter of sort of, of getting to work on it. Yeah, thanks. So uh, the, there's a number of themes emerging for me. Uh, out of uh, out of the various sort of uh, things we've heard from from the panel this morning, and uh, perhaps I can just throw out a, a fairly open question, uh, and perhaps if if anybody um, feels like sort of stepping stepping in and, and giving a response, then that would be great. Um, if, if nobody wants to, then I'll just have to move on fairly quickly. But uh, we've heard about the importance of the the seafarers, the knowledge they hold the need to bring them into uh, the conversation, the, the the work that's required to address the, the training needs and so on, future development uh, to meet this challenge. How do we do that? So is it working effectively now? Um, and, and if it's not, what needs to be done to improve that um, access that seafarers have to that conversation so anybody like to respond steve i'll, I'll have a go I'll well thanks go. thanks uh, matt yeah um what did we do today um there was an old uh, renowned football manager not too far from where steven sits some years ago and said um <clears throat> without supporters we have nothing um and actually, we all need to be fully aware that without seafarers, there is no shipping. That's the baseline. Um, we're not consistent or aligned as an industry. We're doing things differently. Um, we see competitive advantage. Right now, where we are, we need to show our cards. We need to collaborate, sh share information, learn from one another tap into the expertise that we're, we're talking about today and really, really need to look in the mirror to understand, are we engaging with our seafarers? Do we give them the respect? Are they motivated? Are they uh, fulfilled? How is their mental well-being? Um, and then we stand a chance of success of having an engagement about this decarbonization journey that we're on. And not before we have that uh, baseline where we have an engagement. We've got a mutual respect and they're part of our team. Uh, and then we can start to discuss training requirements, competence requirements, et cetera. Uh, and so th this, is a, this is a people business that we're in. The technology will look after itself. We've got so much expertise out there. But let's bring it back to basics this is the human factor so and that's the starting position to be more aligned as an industry more collaborative and sharing of information uh, there is no competitive advantage in safety thanks matt john 
Yeah, just just to add to that, I think um, Matt's absolutely right. But I think when we look at how we engage with uh, the, the the human community, the people, the seafarers, um, there are both formal networks and there are informal ones. So if we take, for example, the professional bodies that uh, Stephen mentioned earlier on, the Nautical Institute, IMRS, we've also got the trade unions uh, and, and so on um, that, that bring people together in, in a structured and semi-structured way and have got really good communication channels in terms of engaging in the debate. There are also less structured and less formal ones, particularly uh, through the uh, the welfare societies, the missions to seafarers, the Stella Maris and so on and so forth. And I say they're less formal, not because their organisations are less formal, but their interaction with the seafarers are likely to be less coordinated because of the, um, you know, the, the ships calling it port and so on and so forth. So I think there's another opportunity of, of, of uh, engaging through that. One of the roles I have is, is to work with uh, what we call the Human Element Industry Group, which brings together about 20 NGOs at the International Maritime Organization. And between those organizations, we've all got our own outreach to, to a different part of the community as well. So I think there is um, both a, a, a sense of uh, hearts and minds, but also engagement that can really be um, pulled together, but not without effort. And I think that, you know, is where the leadership comes in about how we develop clarity around the message and how we open up, whether it's through formal communication, social media, but a whole range of channels. But it's also about making sure it's not one way. It's not just about transmitting. It's about making sure we've got open lines of communication to learn about the real concerns that seafarers might have and how they've got an opportunity of raising those to the right forum. And I think we're part of that message, uh, but other people need to be as well. Thank you. Stephen, any thoughts? Yeah, I mean, w one of the big successes, I think, that's even allowed shipping to be in this position of moving forward and having a transition has been the kind of transparency that came in about 20 years ago with the um, International Ship and Port Facility Security Code. The fact that we started to look at ships differently and understand that we needed to know where they were, what they were doing and the impacts they had. I think that has fundamentally been the foundation that allows us to move forward. What we now conversely see is the fact that I don't think we know enough about seafarers collectively. There's only a modest population, you know, 1.9 million. It's only a you know a reasonable sized city at best, and we we often kind of treat them as too disparate, uh, misunderstood. We don't have a sense of of who they are, where they are, what they're doing, and increasingly important, how they're moving through the industry. So I think somehow a kind of an international mechanism that would allow us to better understand where seafarers fit into all of this. We have IMO numbers for ships, you know, perhaps an, an ILO number for seafarers that would allow us an industry-wide international collective view of who is doing what, how they're moving through, obviously with due reference to data security and, and individual liberty, et cetera, but done in a way that allows us to finally know who is on what ship, what are they doing, what experience they have, what fuels have they been dealing with, what experiences they've got, where they are in their career journey, have they moved ashore, where are they going? So a lifelong engagement with the maritime industry would help everyone from the very first starter through to the most experienced masters and chiefs moving through their career as well. And I think until we have that unified international perspective on this, then seafarers will always be held slightly to one side because we feel slightly threatened by the lack of knowledge we have about them collectively. Thanks, Stephen. Martha, any, anything you want to add? I mean, I think a lot of great things have already been said. I mean, I think, you know, going back to, to Matt's point, um, around, you know, culture and mutual respect, both on board and on shore, you know, really important. We know that safety culture and, and that mindset, you know, is, 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 you know, is essential before any of this training has even taken place. So, yeah, definitely bringing it, it back to those basics. Maybe just one additional aspect. Um, obviously, John did um, reference the trade unions and the importance of engaging, you know, of course, with unions um, around this topic. Um, in our sort of maritime just transition task force, we also have um, a global industry peer learning group uh, consisting of around 50 organizations now, including eight seafarers unions. Um, and this is a kind of platform whereby we sort of engage on a number of topics around decarbonization. And it's sort of a platform um, whereby um, the unions from different places in the world can also engage with industry 
um, and academia sort of around these topics. So once again, that is more of a kind of top down approach <laughs> and recognizing that we need to have both top down and bottom up, starting with that kind of safety culture and safety mindset and, you know, that mutual respect on board. But then, of course, these kind of, you know, platforms enabling that structural exchange between unions and, and industry you know, are also really important. And of course, yes, as I said, the role of unions in engaging with members and, you know, communicating um, it, it is, is also a really critical. Thanks. Uh, another, another sort of theme that I think um, has sort of stood out to me from the conversation so far is that on the one hand, we have the, the sort of climate change imperative and the need to address greenhouse gas uh, emissions. Um, and, and that introduces a need for some sort of sense of urgency and speed in, in addressing um, this particular question. But then, then, as I think it was Matt who said earlier, there is also um, a real need to get this right. And does that, do you think, introduce a tension or, 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 or is there, how do we manage what appears to be a tension between those two things? So, uh, yeah, so, sorry to ambush you with that, but perhaps, uh, perhaps John, you might have some thoughts. Um, thank you for the ambush. Um, <laughs> uh, um you know, I, I, I think we could make a start. I, I think, if if we consider our industry, we, we've always been flexible, responsive, and very, very capable. Look at the sustainable operations that we delivered throughout COVID on a global scale. The, the maritime community knows how to get things done as part of the logistics side, supply chain. It's an amazing community. Um, and, I, and I think, of course, there's some uncertainty in, in what fuels are going to take precedence but there are some common features you know that we 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 know for example that we've been carrying uh, liquefied gases at cold temperatures for 30 40 years we know how to do this safely what we haven't done is train everybody how to do that so i think if we if we look at some of the key messages it is about um uh, how our uh, seafarers know the basics why have we got a need for a change what does that mean because if we don't engage them in the message well they just say oh i need to do this but we need to give them a little bit of understanding of the context in which we're changing to the next generation of fuels we need to look at some of the common hazards that will be faced um, by uh, any of the next generation fuels and we can provide that training in in a in a properly uh, delivered um taught and assessed uh, methodology and as Stephen says keeping proper records so that people have got that mobility as well and of course as a particular company or a particular ship just as you do with any induction on any ship you need to learn specific details to top up um, the the very detailed requirement that comes from it but I think we shouldn't use uncertainty and of course there's some uncertainty we shouldn't use uncertainty um as an excuse for inertia we we can start on this journey now we probably can't deliver the whole message right now but we can start on that training so i think yes let's look at what is the common stuff we we've got enough knowledge there between us we've got some good practice out there which i'll happily talk about another time but um you know let's bring that to the table let's agree what it is and let's minimize the delta between what people already know and what they're going to need uh, into the future so that's just the start of a conversation but some thoughts thank you yeah um, maybe i'll just maybe come in if that's all right andy sure. um because yeah so i think so really understand understand that discourse and i think you know we are in an urgent situation with respect to, to what we need to do and how quickly but we also have a lot of low-hanging fruit <laughs> that we can already sort of tap into energy efficiency is a huge one for instance i mean there's so much we can do on energy efficiency up to 2030 um uh, that of which we know a lot about <laughs> and which people just aren't doing enough about and that is really if we can concentrate on that between now and 2030, we would have made huge strides in that period up to 2040. Of course, we do need to move over to the alternative fuels. But what it's 2023 now, <laughs> a lot of the a lot of work has already been done. We already know a lot of the, the cross competences across these fuels. 
Um, it really is also a matter of coordinating within the industry, understanding who's doing what. I'm constantly learning about new studies, new safety studies that are being undertaken, you know, making sure that we're speaking with each other, taking all the knowledge that is being generated. And once that once we've done that, which is something we as a task force also look to do, you know, you do see that there is a lot happening. <laughs> there are a lot of low hanging fruit. And it's about also changing that narrative and making sure that we are acknowledging how much knowledge we do have as, as an industry what we are doing to address the risks. And I think one thing that I see that shipping has done from the outset or is doing is, you know, a lot of industries are approaching and, and, you know, tackling the green transition, but haven't necessarily had this sort of coordinated approach with respect to training and skills development, and then also safety and technology. Um, And, you know, we're doing that. (laughs) We're having these conversations. Um, A lot of things have already sort of taken place to ensure that happens. Um, so, you know, I'm confident that we don't need to use this as an excuse. Uh, there are lots of things that we can already do today um, and lots of things that we still need to do. But let's put that timeline together. Let's work out who's doing what. And, you know, it should not be a reason for inertia by any stretch of the imagination. Thanks. Matt, Stephen, anything to add? Uh, yeah, from my perspective, I think one of the the real kind of concerns I have is that there appears to be a lack of empathy all too often in the discussions about you know the missing voice of seafarers and what they put in so I think that you know we have to empathize with what the reality is so what are seafarers concerned about well they're worried about whether they're going to have a job in the future what the impact is of of you know all this change we've still got the kind of uh, you know the sword of damocles of automation hanging everyone over everyone's heads you know are seafarers going to be redundant in the near term increasingly that seems not to be the case but there are those concerns and at, at nautical institute events where we've had cadets come and talk to us that's one of the things they always stress they just don't know if they're going to have a career so you know we're expecting them to learn and have be part of just transition when they don't even necessarily know if there's going to be that career for them we hope there will be and but we need to reassure i think as well from the purely operational perspectives you know from from deck officers wondering what on earth impact of all these sails and flatten the rotors and and bubbles coming out the hull what what do they do how am i going to learn about them how am i going to be ready to navigate my ship safely and effectively with that going on what happens with the bunkers who's doing this where are we getting it all these very immediate fears are being voiced by seafarers and we need to find the mechanism to communicate the answers ask the questions give the answers and then we can all move forward together positively Thanks, Stephen. Matt, anything to add? No, I think uh, the team have um, responded uh, appropriately. Uh, I think there's a real opportunity for our industry to to reboot, reset the bar, review how we're doing things today, how we can engage better going forward. And it's a two-way engagement. Uh, And we need to listen better, more, um, but more importantly, we need to take action from what we hear. Um, and the seafarers are at the, at the heart of this. And again, um, I, I'm looking at one of the questions here, and, and we need to start now. You know, the targets have been set. Maybe MEPC next week will, will amend that. But you know, regulation will improve or accelerate the pace of decarbonization, EEXI, CII, the carbon taxes, et cetera, with the emission trading schemes. So the, 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 the charters, ship owners will be hit in the pocket for carbon taxes. So therefore, this will accelerate and enable um, the, the greener fuels of the future um, pathways. But until then, we really need to, to review how we're doing things today with seafarers um, and motivation. Retention, as I mentioned earlier, is the key to this. This is the platform for growth. Uh, and uh, let's not forget that. Keep it simple. Thank you, Andy. Yeah, thanks, Matt. Um, I'm just conscious of time. Um, we've, we only have a, a few minutes left to us, although I think really uh, the conversation could probably go on for hours um 
but perhaps Matt, I could, I could come back to you with 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 one more question, and then see if if the panel wish to build on it at all. Uh, and that is, what particular non technical skills does maritime need to focus on to support technical training for future fuels? So, what non technical skills to focus or support technical training for future fuels? Any thoughts? I think uh, it's a very, very good question. You know, we will address the technical elements of what to do, and we'll we'll, we'll get the procedures and policies, and and and, and working with uh, stakeholders and industry regulators. That will all happen. But what what can we do um, regarding non-technical skills as an industry? Um, again, empathetic to where we are today. Um, the importance of seafarers, the importance of safety. <laughs> Whatever we do, it's all about a management of change. Uh, it's all about risk assessment and risk awareness. And if it's not already there, we need to factor that into everything that we're doing today going forward in shipping. Uh, it's already a hazardous environment and our seafarers are doing a wonderful job. If on Sunday there, it was the day of the seafarer and, and we're, we're, we're acknowledging that today. and the theme is oceans worth protecting. There's no one closer to the oceans than our seafarers. And I'm bringing this back to very, very simplistic terms. We need to get to know our seafarers, their capabilities, their aspirations, their ambitions, and what gets them out of bed in the morning and what makes them come back to us to do a very good job, an important job, keeping the global economies alive. So I think it's more from a human element perspective, Andy, these are the non-technical skills that we all need to adopt and be aligned with. Thank you. John? Yeah, I think the um, the, the point that, that Matt's raised is absolutely spot on, but I th I'm not sure that the particular question of the, the non-technical skills relates just to uh, future fuels. I, I think we, we recognise um, in an increasingly sophisticated and uncertain society, maritime society, that we need better communication skills. We need to understand our people better. We need to understand their career aspirations, but also their own personal values, family values, and so on and so forth. So I think, you know, we call them leadership skills, management skills, um, soft skills. There's a whole range of stuff that I think um, SDCW just touches on. Um, but I think as a maritime community, we should be working much harder to understand what is effective leadership. And effective leadership is difficult in a changing environment. It's more difficult in a changing environment. So we need to make sure that our um, our staff from, from cradle to grave have actually got those skills to be able to communicate and support each other uh, right across the board, not just because of uh, future fuels, but in, in a completely uh, dynamic and changing environment. Thanks, John. Uh, Martha, um, Stephen, any, anything to, to add to that? Well, I, I've just kind of been thinking about the quickest way to sum everything up that I've heard, and, and I think it's been a great debate and, and great to hear from, from everyone. I think really I can distill what I think in, in four words and all begin with E. Uh, I think we need to empathise. I think we need to engage. We need to encourage and then we need to educate. And I think with those kind of, you know, focuses in our back pocket, then we've got a chance of really getting where we need to go with everyone coming along for that journey as well. So thank you. Thanks, Stephen. Uh, it's a really good summary, actually. Thanks. Um, Martha, any final thoughts? No, I, I really think, you know, thanks so much for the, this great discussion. A lot has been said. Um, I don't have uh, words beginning with the same letter. <laughs> uh, <laughs> But the one thing, well, two things, actually, and they do begin with the same letter. So I don't know if that's a theme. <laughs> um, but um, this coordination piece is really important. There's a lot happening. A lot of really good things are happening. But let's kind of make sure that we know uh, sort of who's doing what. And, you know, that the more that we work together and, and, and you know, everyone takes a little piece <laughs> of what needs to be done, the more likely it is that we'll get to those sort of 2030 and 2050 targets. And then I was going to say collaboration, but maybe it's that two-way collaboration and engagement um, that, that we've been talking about throughout, uh, which is which is so important. And of course, the more we can have forums like this where we can engage um, with each other and, and also with the audience, um, the better. So thank you. Uh, well, I think that just about brings us to the end of our time. 
So I would like to thank all of our panelists this morning, Stephen, John, Matt, Martha, thank you so much for, for a great discussion. Uh, thank you to everyone who's joined us uh, on the web uh, and thank you for your great questions. Thank, I'm sorry we didn't manage to get to them all. Um, but yes, it's, it's a big thank you from, from me to you. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you.